Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? What? Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's loud enough. Okay, so this talk is about auditing and exploiting Apple IPC. Uh, it still always amazes me whenever I come to the US how many people use MacBooks. Uh, like I was on the train coming down from New York and absolutely everyone in the carriage was using an Apple device. It was uh, amazing. So yeah, it's popular. Uh, so a quick little introduction about me. Uh, I'm a security researcher with Google Project Zero. <clears throat> so I started looking at Apple stuff about a year ago, really. Um, I won Pwn for Fun, which was a contest that we kind of invented for ourselves um, with a JavaScript core bug and some uh, OSX kernel bugs. And then over the last year, I kind of continued that work uh, looking for OSX and iOS, uh, sandbox escapes, and also privilege escalations. So during this talk, you will understand why the MacBook Air that I won now runs Ubuntu. Uh, so over the last year, um, as part of my work at Google, I've reported about 60 sandbox escapes and privilege escalations, about 10 of which are still unpatched, and uh, we'll see a demo of one of those later after we've understood a bit about the very broad attack surface that we have available to us on OS X. And so as I say, all the work I've done has really been focusing on OS X, but there is an awful lot of overlap uh, between the OS X kernel and user space and iOS. And so I have accidentally found some iOS kernel bugs, even though that's not what I was looking for. Uh, so in this talk, we're gonna give an overview of almost all the IPC mechanisms on iOS and OS X. I say almost because these are just the ones that I've been able to find out about. Uh, you will see just quite how many different types of IPC there are and that they are all actually used in security critical ways. Uh, so most fundamentally, we will have like a dive into Mach messages, which are the proprietary, well, not really proprietary, but the uh, fundamental building block of all of the proprietary IPC mechanisms. And it's really important to know how they work to understand what the attack model or what the uh, threat model is for stuff that's using Mac messages under the hood. Um, we're then gonna take a deep dive into XPC, which is this new-ish, as of I think uh, iOS 7 and uh, 10.7 on OS X, this new-ish IPC service that's supposed to be the thing you're supposed to use for all your IPC. We'll look at, so, so in the previous talk, uh, they spoke about how great it is that everything on iOS is sandboxed, and we'll see that all, an awful lot of that sandboxing is built using XPC to communicate between all of those sandboxes, and in actual fact, there were fundamental design problems with XPC that meant you could hop between almost all of these sandboxes, so yeah. So we'll look at how you go about finding those bugs, uh, how you exploit them, and then we'll also look at uh, some other flavors of IPC, uh, specifically looking at this daemon called font D, which is uh, exposed to the most interesting sandboxes on OS X, so it's not there on iOS. Uh, so we'll look at the various types of IPC that font D uses, and also look at how we can exploit some of those font D bugs. And we'll talk a little bit about mitigations and the future. So the IPC zoo. Fundamentally, XNU, this is the open source part of the OS X and iOS kernel. And this is what is gonna actually let us talk between process A on the left and process B. What we want to do is communicate between these two processes, so inter-process communication. So the fundamental building block of everything that we're gonna talk about are Mach messages. And so you can see that the Mach message box like, just drops down into the kernel portion down below. And so this is the fundamental primitive that lets us send something from one process and it appears on the other side. Mach messages are a very low level type of IPC and although plenty of stuff does just use this low level, OS X, provides, OS X and iOS provide many different abstractions, most of which we're gonna look at today. Uh, so the simplest one is just CF port, which is really just a core foundation wrapper around a Mach port and it provides you it doesn't really provide you anything. Um, there's a CF message port, which is a slightly nicer abstraction on top of a CF port. But then there are a whole load more things which provide, and a whole load more uh, IPC mechanisms that provide a lot more 
uh, provide more building blocks. So MIG is uh, the Mach interface generator. And this is used for an awful lot of stuff. Most interestingly, it's used for all of the uh, Mach kernel APIs. They use this MIG tool, which uh, has an interface definition language, which we might look at a bit later, uh, to let you specify in a kind of higher level way the messages that you want to send from one process to another. And so there are there is another low level, uh, or reasonably low level, uh, mechanism built upon Mach messages, which is called XPC. And so XPC is this new-ish replacement for MIG. It's not built on MIG. It works directly with Mach messages. And so on top of MIG, there are a bunch of other, even higher level, um, inter-process communication protocols, one of which is distributed notifications. And we'll take a look at how they work later. And then also, not necessarily on top of XPC, we have this other thing called NSXPC, and we'll talk a bit about that. And then there are other more obscure, older um, IPC mechanisms. So DO here stands for uh, distributed objects, which is a very old thing from like the next step days. But uh, it's still used, and uh, we'll look a bit at how you use that and also show you a demo of uh, local privilege escalation using distributed objects. So those are the ones we're going to talk about in this talk. But since OSX is a Unix-based system, you have also got all of the IPC mechanisms that you would expect on any old Unix system. So you have signals, which really are a type of IPC, uh, domain sockets, shared memory, FIFOs, semaphores, socket pairs. And in addition to that, you also have a couple of things that uh, Chris mentioned in the previous talk. Uh, he didn't mention Apple Events, which is another IPC, but he did talk briefly about pasteboard, uh, which is yet another type of IPC. So as you can see, there really are a lot of different types of uh, IPC uh, systems available on OSX. And for some of these, if you try and search online for any information about how they're actually implemented, for example, how does NSXPC actually work? How do distributed objects actually work? How does XPC actually work? Uh, you will find absolutely nothing. So why do we care about IPC? The first reason that we care is that if you're exploiting an iOS or OSX device, it's hopefully, probably, the case that the initial code execution vector you have lands you in some kind of sandbox in user space. Unless you have some awesome uh, networking bugs, you probably are a sandbox user. So these are, for example, getting code execution in a renderer or a plugin process in Chrome or Safari. Uh, quick look if you're plugging in a USB stick. Uh, NTPD, uh, which is your network time uh, server. Or an App Store app, like we spoke about earlier. Unfortunately, plenty of interesting stuff is still unsandboxed on OS X. So Adobe Reader, it's sandboxed on uh, Windows, but there's nothing on, uh, on OS X. So let's briefly just look at the models of those kinds of sandbox escapes. So the first would be uh, privilege separation, where you have one application that has, for example, a trusted broker. So this is the term used in uh, Internet Explorer. Um, but it applies equally well here to uh, Safari or Chrome. And your application has got to parse some untrusted data, or it has some large code base for which the developer doesn't really trust it, say uh, FFmpeg, for example. And so the way that you as a developer go about doing this is you split those two bits of functionality in half, and then on the one side and the left-hand side, we have uh, some kind of sandbox, whatever that might be. And on the right-hand side, we have uh, an unsandbox trusted broker process. And in between these two, we have some kind of IPC mechanism. So that if you get code execution in the sandboxed process, you're hopefully restricted in what you can do. So uh, some examples of this. So PP API is the uh, Pepper plugin API, which is, for example, what is the process that hosts uh, sandbox Flash in Chrome. And uh, there's a similar thing for Safari, so the web content uh, process or the web content XPC service, as it is now, um, also lives in a sandbox. And it has some IPC mechanism, which I think might have changed recently. But it has some IPC mechanism to allow it to talk to 
the host side of WebKit 2 for Safari. Uh, so Apple, if you go and uh, search for Apple sandboxing, they will tell you about how you can write XPC services and you can magically split up all of your dangerous code and safe code and XPC kind of handles this for you. And we'll look at what that really means later. So there is another uh, model where rather than a developer having one application that they want to split in two, instead it's a sandbox application like NTPD, which does run in a sandbox, although it does run, although it runs as root, uh, you can still sandbox uh, processes owned by root on OS X. It's sandboxed, but it has to talk to a bunch of unsandboxed uh, helper processes, one of which is NetworkD. And so uh, the reason that NTPD wants to talk to NetworkD is that NetworkD knows things about, it knows higher level information about your network state. Like for example, you're connected via a cellular connection. And so there is an IPC mechanism that lets NTPD talk to NetworkD. And so what this talk is about is how does that IPC mechanism work? How can we find bugs in it? And how can we exploit it to be able to hop from our sandbox process into a transitively uh, unsandbox process? I say transitively there because network D is not sandbox, but it does run as its own user. So you are still slightly uh, restricted. But we'll see that the types of bugs that we find will allow, will allow us to simply hop from NTPD into network D into some other daemon running as root. And so yeah. Uh, so I say hopping to some other daemon running as root. So privilege escalation is the other uh, reason that we're interested in IPC bugs. So there are two slightly different models here between OSX and iOS. I'm sure you're all familiar with that. It's been mentioned before by Patrick and other people today that on OSX, uh, if you uh, have code executing as root, an unsandboxed root user, uh, it is equivalent to kernel code execution, uh, no matter what Apple will tell you. Um, for example, you have physical memory access when you run as root. There is a IO kit user client called, uh, I think it's IO hardware access or something like that, that lets you read and write physical memory. So it's all over kernel code signing or no kernel code signing. Uh, on iOS, it is definitely not that easy. Um, the attack surface is much larger when you're there as root, but unsurprisingly, they have removed the uh, physical memory access uh, <laughs> from iOS. So just to quickly show you that diagrammatically, so we have network D on the left-hand side, which runs as a regular user, um, and sysmond doing system monitoring probably, which uh, runs as root, uh, unsandboxed running as root. And again, there is an IPC mechanism that lets us talk from network D, talk to sysmond. So if we get code execution in network D, we can hop over into sysmond. So we'll look at briefly at the low level kind of Mach message fundamentals that underlie all of this stuff. So what actually is a Mach message? Um, we're just gonna look at this header. We'll look at every field because it's really important when you're looking at this stuff in IDA to be able to see what is actually going on. Uh, so every Mach message begins with this header which has uh, six fields. Uh, the most significant uh, bit of the first field tells us, is this a complex Mach message? And we'll see what complex means later on. Um, then it has some complicated flags, which we'll ignore. Uh, it then tells us the size of the message. <laughs> Interestingly, there have been bugs in the past. So this size field is only the size of the message which was actually sent by the sender. When you receive messages, you can ask the kernel to provide you this thing called an audit trailer, which we'll look at in a second. And this audit trailer is the way that you can attempt to verify who actually sent you a message. But the only way that you can verify that the audit trailer is actually genuine is that the place in your message where you find the audit trailer, that size of data is not included in this size field. So you can imagine, that if you're gonna start parsing these Mac messages yourself, and plenty of IPC uh, code does try to parse them themselves, it's really hairy. Uh, so following that, we have a couple of Mac ports. Um, so these are where we want to send the message to, or who we receive the message from. 
Uh, there's this thing called the voucher port, which is new in Yosemite, and I have no idea what it does, but maybe someone out there knows what it does. Uh, and finally, the most important field, really, is the message ID field. Uh, this is completely ignored by the Mach um, kernel stuff. It, when you send messages to user space, when you send them to the kernel, it, it's used for something. But for user space, it's completely ignored. But the use of that field is that in, all of the IPC, in almost all of the IPC systems, they use this to basically demux the message. Um, so basically like an RPC identifier, so called method one, this will have a one, method two. So following that header, we can send, if that C uh, bit was set, then we can follow that header with these things called descriptors. And uh, we'll look at what descriptors are in just a second. Then we can actually finally send some data. So this inline data can be absolutely anything. It's just binary data. And then following that inline data, we can have this, uh, these trailers, which I mentioned, which are these audit records appended by the kernel so that you can try to work out who actually sent you this message. So um, there are two types of, port uh, two types of um, descriptors that we'll look at. The first is uh, port descriptors. These let you send mach ports to other processes. That basically means that I can, if I can talk to some service, I can send that ability to talk to a process to another process. Uh, but the most important one for us today are out-of-line descriptors. And this is basically the thing that makes uh, Mach messages and Mach IPC really awesome and work really well. Um, so this lets you do kind of quite fancy uh, copy on write virtual memory copies of big chunks of data between processes. So this is how, for example, I can send a one gigabyte Mach message very, very quickly to another process because it doesn't really actually copy that one gigabyte of uh, virtual memory into another process. It just messes with, messes with the page tables such that only if those pages are written does it have to make an actual copy. Um, and so, again, these just have a little descriptor structure which basically tells you the uh, range of pages to copy when you send that message. Um, so the other fundamental building block of IPC on OSX is this process called LaunchD. Uh, LaunchD is PID1, so it's often described as the init equivalent uh, on OSX. So init being the first uh, user space process on like most Unix systems. So one important thing that LaunchD does is manage system services. What that means is if you try to connect to any of these system services, you go via LaunchD. Every process can talk, can talk to LaunchD. You cannot, you can sort of attempt to prevent this, but you can't really prevent this. So this is a very, very important attack surface if you can find bugs in this way that you talk to LaunchD. As I mentioned, it provides the mechanism to look up system services and connect to them. And another important thing to, to notice here is that LaunchD doesn't care about what IPC mechanism you actually use to talk to other system services. It's happy to vend distributed objects or MIG or XPC or NS XPC connections. It only cares about vending these uh, send rights to Mach ports. Once it's handed those, once both ends of the connection are set up, LaunchD is no longer involved. Uh, so here's just an example. You can look at the, you can grab the code from the slides another time about how we actually connect to a LaunchD service. We just get this thing called the Bootstrap port, which, as I, said, which I, as I mentioned, every process can talk to LaunchD. The way it does that is by getting this thing called the Bootstrap port, which lets you talk to LaunchD, and then you can just use this Bootstrap lookup with a service name, and you've got a Mac port to talk to this service. So the ways that you actually create a service, so how do we like find out what's actually listening? So the canonical way you're supposed to do it, and this is mentioned by Patrick when he was talking about the ways that uh, the OSX malware uh, persist. So what they do is they drop plists uh, into these directories, the system library launch, uh, launch daemons and launch agents. And these plists contain service names. So in this case, this is uh, NFSD, so its name or its identifier is com.apple.nfsd. 
and launch D will take this, and when someone tries to connect to com.apple.nfsd, launch D knows that it's got to go and exec this path to an executable, so sbin nfsd. It's slightly more complicated than that, but that's the, that's the gist of it. So there are other ways that we can um, create LaunchD services. So um, if you're auditing code and you're looking for places where we can, where you can um, find the message handling code, so bootstrap check-in is where you'll actually pass a reference to, or in this case, you'll pass the address of a Mac port, and this uh, API will write you a port name there, and then any subsequent um, Mach message reads on that port are reading from remote uh, clients of that service. Uh, there's also a deprecated, but still a quite widely used way of registering services without having to use the LaunchD uh, plists. You can just call this bootstrap register function. So here you can register a function called, uh, register a service called my service. Excuse me. And then you can go ahead and read Mac messages from service port, and all the messages you read will have been sent by clients. So you want to go find the message handling code just in IDA, find all the XRFs to the service port, and find where it's being passed to Mac message. So there's this tool, command line tool called launch control, and this is used to manage LaunchD. What I haven't mentioned so far is that if you go online and try and look for any information about LaunchD, it's been completely rewritten uh, as of Yosemite. So pretty much everything that you can find online is completely out of date and won't work. Um, but here's one thing to start you off. Pseudo launch control print system will show you a bunch of system services. So just to get an idea of the attack surface available to us for a privilege escalation point of view. We can use launch control and we can try to enumerate a list of all the services which are running as root. So we start off and we get this list, except the list is quite a lot longer than this and it goes on onto like multiple pages. So you can see that there are a huge number of services running as root on your, uh, on your OS X and iOS system. So, how do we actually, or what are, what's available in order to build like more useful services? Because as we mentioned, using Mach messages directly is really horrible. So let's look in an abstract way at how an IPC mechanism is built. So again, we have two process contexts here. On the left-hand side, we're sending some kind of message, and we want it to appear on the other side. Uh, so the first interesting thing is how we interface with the kernel. The kernel then somehow manages that message, that data structure, and it appears on the other side as a Mac message. There's some interface that lets whatever abstraction layer you're using, be it XPC, distributed objects, distributed notifications, MIG, parse that Mac message. And this is a very interesting attack surface because there's a lot of complexity involved in turning a Mac message into a distributed object for example. Uh, and then on top of that abstraction layer, we have another interface where the actual service code talks to XPC to try and get useful data out of the messages. Uh, so to make this more concrete, this is an example of those attack surfaces when you look at XPC. So the lowest level here that we'll look at today is how the XPC code deserializes those Mach messages to build its internal data structures. Uh, we'll then take a look at some of those internal data structures and then look at the API that XPC exposes to service code so that it can go ahead and access stuff from those uh, XPC messages. So as I mentioned before, if you look online for details about the implementation of XPC, there's pretty much nothing. So we're gonna have to start from some hex DOMs. But uh, a few high-level things that we do know, it's not built using MIG, so it's using just raw Mac messages. Uh, you can find out from, but by looking at the, the documentation for XPC, for XPC services, that uh, what it is is a schemaless message passing abstraction. What that means is, unlike MIG, which 
has a strongly typed definition for what every message must contain. XPC has nothing like that. There is no centralized schema for a service that says, this is what every message must look like. There's, it just doesn't exist. Uh, so what messages are, are strongly typed dictionaries. They're not core foundation dictionaries, they are new XPC dictionaries. And there are a bunch of data types that you can put in these XPC dictionaries. You can put another XPC dictionary, uh, you can create an XPC array, you can put XPC strings, and then you can have integers, UUIDs, data, which just lets you wrap raw bytes, dates, bools, and in fact there are a bunch of these. So here's an example of an XPC message written out in a kind of uh, JSON-esque uh, JSON um, appearance, but this is not what XPC messages look like. But it gives you an example of what, uh, at a high level, they actually look like. So it's a dictionary with keys and values, and those values can themselves be dictionaries or lists. The wire format is nothing like this. So um, one approach to reversing or to, to understanding how this kind of thing works would be to sit in IDA and just reverse the serialization and deserialization code and slowly build up a picture of how it works. But another kind of quite nice way to do it is just write a test program to send little messages and then find the right place using LLDB to break and just start dumping hex. And so this is a Mach message. And so when we looked at the structure of a Mach message before, we can see that those first um, hex 18 bytes are the Mach message header. So we can see that this is not a complex message. So the, the most significant bit of the first uh, D word is zero. You can see that it's hex 40 bytes. It's not so interesting. Uh, I don't know how uh, readable this is, but you can then see that the first actual four bytes of the XPC message are just XPC exclamation mark in ASCII. Um, and then we can see some kind of like serialized object. And what you do, you sit there and you like crank through all of these to try sending a dictionary with a key and a value of a string, and then try sending an integer. And you can see that it's actually a very simple um, serialization format, basically passing a type ID, a length, and then data. And so we can go through and look at all of these. And so what we're interested in, because we want to find and exploit bugs, is where is the code that actually reads that and deserializes it into some kind of internal XPC object. So if you want to go and find that code, it's these XPC type deserialize methods. And these take this XPC serializer T, which has a pointer to the data, and an integer which tells you how much data is left. So the deserializers themselves are reasonably robust, actually. They um, impose very sensible limits, so you can't send an array and tell it that it has FFFFFFFF members. It will stop you. It stops you at like 40,000 or something like that. But nevertheless. So this is the API that is actually used to create the XPC objects. So we can use this to help us uh, determine the structure, the internal structure of the XPC objects. So it takes the um, this kind of constructor-esque function, takes this extra field, which tells us you need to allocate this many bytes for some extra fields for my uh, for my object. So we can look at the um, at the XPC type deserialize. So for example, XPC string deserialize, and we can see what it does and we can work out what those member functions, oh sorry, those member variables of the XPC objects are. So uh, the first ones that we will look at are these very simple, um, like simple objects that just have one data field, like a double or an int or a date, which just have eight bytes of data, and they're super simple. Uh, the second type, uh, XPC strings, they have two fields, so when they call the XPC object create, they pass uh, hex 10, to allocate uh, 16 bytes for the two fields, and they just contain the length of the string, and then they call strudup to um, <clears throat> allocate a copy of the string, and they store a pointer to that copy. Uh, we can keep going, and so we have uh, this UUID type, which just has 16 bytes of controlled data. A much bigger object here, which is the XPC data, 
which has these other kind of interesting fields, like a dispatch object T pointer, dispatch data size, and a bunch of flags. Um, XPC array, kind of similar to a string. Uh, and also this XPC dictionary type, and we'll see why it's important to look at this dictionary later on. But uh, XPC dictionaries are pretty simple. It's basically has six hash buckets and uses a simple hash function. And then within each of those buckets is just a linked list, which is this kind of structure, a linked list of um, dictionary entries where the key for your dictionary, where the key for the object is allocated in line in this linked list structure and the object is pointed to by, by the uh, object pointer. It's important to know how this uh, linked list structure works because we'll look at how we exploit some bugs and this is a really helpful structure. So the last layer to look at is the XPC services API. So how you as the developer of a service actually talk to XPC to get data out of these dictionaries. <clears throat> so the first API is the so called, well, they don't call it the safe version, but it is the safe version which is XPC dictionary or array get and then a type. So this is a strongly typed uh, API that is if you have an XPC dictionary and you call for example XPC dictionary get string and, and, pass the, and pass the key and the value is not a string, this will return null. So it's actually checking the type of the, um, of the value that it's going to return you. This is really nice, and this is how they should have left the API. But they also added an unsafe version. So in this case, XPC dictionary or array get value. And at that point, it's up to you as a developer to manually go ahead and check what the type of that value actually is. So it returns an XPC object T, which if you're writing, if you're using the C API, this is really just typed up to avoid pointer. So the compiler is not going to help you. It is absolutely up to you to go and check what the type of this return value is. And since it's schemaless, we can send any kind of dictionary we want. So we can have the value of this be any XPC type we want. So like we've gone through all of that. Why is that interesting? So there are a couple of reasons why this might not be interesting at all. So for example, it might be the case that all of those XPC uh, API entry points check all of the types that you pass to them. So for example, well, we'll see some examples later. Maybe they're like defensively coded and they check all of the types that are passed. Before Yosemite, absolutely no entry points checked any of the types. It was all left up to the developer. So in that case, do all the API consumers check the types all the time? Well, some do, but the majority didn't. So what does this actually mean? We can pass the wrong XPC type to an API which is expecting a different type. We'll finally get to a bit of code in a sec to show you exactly what that means. So here is an example, finally, of what happens in XPC when you don't check the types and you use these dangerous values. So in this case, uh, XPC dictionary get value is being passed a message. So this is an attacker controlled dictionary and it's trying to read the value of the key foo from the message dictionary. And it's assigning this to this XPC object called str. So probably this developer is hoping that this thing is gonna be a string. But there's nothing here enforcing that this XPC object is in fact an XPC string. Then on the next line, we call XPC string get string pointer, which is not an internal function. This is the XPC API you're supposed to use to get the C string of your XPC string. And what's the actual implementation of that? Well, it just reads the field at hex 30 in your object and returns it. That's all it is. So that's kind of cool. Because if we look, well, we'll see the object overlap table in a sec to see exactly what we can do with that. Ah, here we go. So we see here that in this object, it will simply read the field at hex 30 and return it and then use it as a string. So if we make a table, and the table is actually much bigger, of all the fields which overlap, 
we can see that, indeed, if it was a string that we passed, that field at hex 30 would be a char star. It would be the, the strud uh string that you passed in when the dictionary was deserialized. But say, for example, we passed an array as the foo value for that attacker controlled dictionary, then this is going to treat an XPC object pointer as a char star. Or, perhaps more interestingly, we can see that the UUID type, we just completely control those bytes. So in this case, we can get it to just print out arbitrary memory as a C string. So can we actually do something more exciting with this, like get code execution? So the most interesting case we see here is where the UUID uh, value field, so the upper uh, eight bytes of it, uh, overlap with this dispatch object T pointer. Uh, so what this means is if we can find some XPC service, of which there are an awful lot, that uses the dangerous API and tries to read a data object without verifying that it is in fact a data object, we can control an object pointer and we'll look at what that code looks like in a sec. So a dispatch object T is just an Objective C object and it's going to have an Objective C method called on it. And Nemo already spoke today about what you can do if you control an Objective-C object pointer. Basically, you win. Uh, and in this case, because we're talking about local privilege escalations, it's actually way, way easier than all the stuff Nemo was talking about because we know where <laughs> all the libraries are already mapped because they're also mapped in our process. It's much, much easier. So this is an example of a vulnerable code construct where from our XPC dictionary, uh, our developer is reading the value of the key data using the dangerous uh, get value API, assigning this to object, and then calling XPC data get bytes pointer from that object. And what under the hood that's gonna do is if we pass an XPC UUID object as data, the second line is gonna go ahead, take the upper eight bytes of that UUID and treat them as Objective-C object pointer and call a method. Actually slightly more complicated, I might just skip over this bit. There's a little bit of uh, heap grooming you have to do to do with the dictionary. But uh, maybe come back and look at these slides. So how do we actually uh, exploit being able to control an Objective-C object uh, pointer? Well, Nemo already did this, so his diagram was much fancier than mine. But basically, you have an Objective-C object pointer. You then point it wherever you want. You just make sure that the first uh, the first keyword there is an is a pointer, which you point to something else you control. You then point that to, you have your fake uh, selector array, which Nemo talked about, and then in there, cached selector, you set the mask to zero, and it's just gonna go ahead and call your cached function pointer. Uh, so the only thing we really need to be able to do is somehow get this controlled uh, data structure uh, at a known address in the remote process. So the technique I have used is like kind of lame heap spray, but it works remarkably well. Um, so all of these services on OSX are 64-bit, but the um, granularity of ASLR is very, very, very small. Um, so a one gigabyte uh, heap spray, which as we saw when we looked at how math messages work, is super, super cheap because it doesn't actually send one gigabyte of data, it just like quickly messages, messes with the page tables to make it appear as if you've copied a gigabyte of data in there. So it's really, really cheap. And it works amazingly well. Yeah, Nemo spoke about some like fancier things you can do, but you don't need to do that. Uh, so this is just an example, a bit of code for how you would heap spray with XPC. You basically just create a big data, a big uh, XPC data object. And then 100% of the time, I have found that this will reliably appear at this page, you know, hex 1, 20, 20, 0, 0, 0, 0. It's just there. So this sounds like there are a lot of prerequisites to actually get an exploitable condition like this. So does this code construct actually really exist? And the answer is yes, it's everywhere. Or it was everywhere until they tried to fix it. Uh, so we looked before at network D. Um, check out this link to see an exploit for network D. Um, that will break you out of NTPD and Safari sandboxes using exactly this bug. And then once you're into Network D, you can use this SysmonD exploit 
to break you from there to root. So these code constructs are everywhere. And this is only one particular uh, type confusion pairing, i.e. taking a UUID and a data and confusing them um, because that was just the easiest way I found to get code execution. But there are a bunch of other types that you could confuse by overlaying on top of each other that could potentially give you code execution as well. Um, so it's also kind of a nice bug class to do some like hacky static analysis. Um, so it's pretty easy to write a little abstract interpretation to find these kinds of bugs. So I have just this very hacky um, abstract interpretation framework for x64 and I ran it over all of the executables on OS X and it found many, many, many more bugs. But of course I wrote it after they patched it, so. <laughs> so what actually were the patches that Apple applied? Um, I say minimal because they have not fixed all instances of XPC type confusion. There are still many, many entry points which aren't hardened. So by that I mean when you call an XPC string get string pointer, there is now a check to say, is the thing that you passed this actually an XPC string? If it isn't, fail. Um, there are still a bunch of API entry points which don't have this check. And this is a very easy patch to make, but it, it's still not been done. Um, so we're gonna look now at uh, another service called uh, FontD. Um, I imagine FontD is kind of familiar to a lot of you, especially if you've done any uh, OSX work. So it's not present on iOS. But FontD is reachable from a bunch of really interesting sandboxes on OS X. Um, most importantly, it's the only system service reachable, it's the only system service that's supposed to be reachable from the Chrome renderer sandbox on OS X. So the FontD process actually hosts two different services. Uh, the first is Font Object Server, and the second is Font Server. Um, both of these are actually reachable from uh, the Chrome Sandbox uh, and Safari. Uh, so this first one, com.apple.fontObjectServer, it doesn't use MIG. It, in fact, as I mentioned at the very beginning, it just uses completely hand-rolled Mach message parsing on top of uh, Core Foundation Mach port. So the parsing code is very, very crazy. Um, it has a bunch of legacy code so for example, if your sender and receiver have different NDNSs running on the same hardware, then it's okay, it can deal with that. So this code is really old. Uh, and it's implemented in uh, lib ACS server, so you can find it on your machine. So this is the Mach message uh, demuxing or the Mach message handling function for font object server. So you can see it's kind of crazy spaghetti. There are like uh, 47 different blue lines coming out of that switch statement. So if you open this up in IDA, it's going to be a long day. So um, I've just got a little bit of IDA Python here. You can grab it from the grab it from the grab it from the slides, which will. <clears throat> so it turns out that this uh, binary also has like a nice string table where it tells you. Uh, it gives you human readable names for all of those uh, switch uh, jumps. So this is just a little bit of IDAPython to like uh, annotate all of those jumps, which is very useful. Uh, and so what you find is you have 47 of these different uh, methods, and like here are all of their names. So rendezvous message, ping server message, shutdown server, user duh info message, all kinds of crazy stuff. And the most interesting one is the last one, <laughs> of course. Um, so just some more IDAPython here um, based on the uh, I had a tool bag from Aaron Portnoy. The other nice thing you really want to do in that situation is be able to click on the jump statement and create a new IDA window that just lists all of the switch uh, destinations and then you can just go through each one. So this just does that for you. So after you've been through the entire list, you reach, oh sorry, it's not the last one, it's like third to last. Uh, you reach this thing, uh, XTURL action message. Uh, so R14, if you can see this, it's a bit small. R14 is the pointer to the Mach message that we've received from the client. So we saw before that the Mach message header is hex 18 bytes. So that means that this uh, LEA instruction is getting a pointer to the first bit of like controlled, uh, attacker controlled data, attacker controlled payload data in that Mach message. So RDI 
points to control data. And that's being passed to this function with a very long name, do handle external action message. So we control what RDI points to. And if we look at that function, we can see that it takes RDI. From there, it dereferences RDI and reads another pointer. So REX yeah. is completely controlled. It's just a pointer read from our message. And then it passes that to Core Foundation Retain. And what this actually means, what this is actually doing, is reading an object pointer from a message sent to us by an attacker and calling an Objective-C method on it. So it's like, you don't even have to do, there's no memory corruption, you just give it a pointer and it calls an Objective-C method on it. So you can use uh, the techniques that Nemo spoke about to trivially get code execution in uh, font D. And realistically, this actually was half a day's work. So you open font D in IDA, you find the handling function, you start going through them all, just looking one function deep of what each of those message messages do, uh, and you find 100% find reliable code execution from the Chrome sandbox. I, in fact, just took the exploit that I've written for those other XPC type confusion bugs, and you can basically just like train, change the trigger code and it all just works. And unfortunately, that's kind of the state of OSX um, security. So <clears throat> this bug is so super simple that you have to ask, why was it never publicly found? Um, so I definitely know that people have been fuzzing font D. Um, if you actually open it up in IDA and have a look at how it goes ahead and passes the message, there are a bunch of like weird things in there. So for example, the field at hex 6C4 has to be the PID of font D. Otherwise, you never hit any of the actual interesting code. There's another field that has to be the client PID. Um, and fuzzers are just, certain classes of fuzzer will never even get past this check. But if you look at it in either, you see, oh, that field's gotta be my PID, let's just step on and you find the bugs easily. So I mentioned that font D actually has two uh, services that it hosts. The other one is this thing called com.apple.fontserver. I will say I don't actually know what either of these services are supposed to do because I've never had to go deep enough into them. Uh, so this is the other service hosted by FontD. This one is based on MIG, so it uses uh, an IPC abstraction layer so that it doesn't have to handle parsing Mach messages itself. Uh, and it's implemented in this uh, lib font registry server, uh, dilib. So <laughs> MIG does some object serialization for you. It has a little interface definition language and you can define simple C structures and uh, MIG will go ahead and serialize them for you. But, of course, FontD has its own custom Core Foundation object serialization format. Uh, so Chris, before, spoke about plists. They could have just used plists, but they have their own serialization format. And again, it's also allowed by a bunch of interesting sandboxes. Uh, so MIG uh, is this open source tool. You can go and have a look at it and see how it generates all of this serialization and deserialization code. Um, one nice thing about doing OSX work is they generally don't strip um, symbols, don't strip function names at least. Um, so for example, if you have a service that uses MIG, uh, when you define a MIG service, one thing you do is give a prefix for all of the uh, functions. So you can just look in IDA at the list of function names and if you see a whole bunch of them with a weird looking prefix like underscore X, then those are probably just all your uh, MIG entry points. <clears throat> Too much text to look at there, but you can look at the slide later. If your, if your um, binary is stripped, uh, you can look for this structure in the data const section, uh, which basically has all, of the, uh, has all of those function pointers in it. So you can, you can easily find the structure. Um, one other really nice thing about MIG is that if this MIG type check uh, macro is defined, which it really is, uh, if it's not, MIG is completely broken, then what this does is generate a bunch of type checking code. Um, so for example, if a function prototype is expecting a string, 
a C string, that it will actually go ahead and like struster in the string to make sure that there is, excuse me, or mem mem probably, to make sure that it is actually null terminated. And it looks through and checks that there are the right number of out of line descriptors so you can find which uh, parameter to the function points to controlled data. So it then goes ahead, unpacks all of those arguments, and passes it to the service code. So I said that uh, font server has its own serialization format. So serialization is the most fundamental property of all IPC systems. It's like the first place as an attacker that you look. Um, should be really simple. It's always done wrong. So on OSX, there are truly an almost uncountable number of implementations of object serialization. Um, there's a bunch of crazy objects serialization that also goes on between user space and the kernel. Um, but this is just looking at, at user space stuff. So these font object server, oh, sorry, font server RPCs take serialized regular core foundation objects. Core foundation already has serialization, but they write, they write their own one. So the implementation of it is in C++, and it's in this C++ uh, class called T core foundation resurrect context. Uh, and this class basically provides just a couple of helper functions for the resurrection functions to use, which basically let you read an integer and raw bytes. And from being able to read an integer and raw bytes, this is gonna resurrect, deserialize um, these types on the right, most of which are quite boring. So like dictionaries, numbers, sets, strings, URLs, but also this kind of interesting one called core foundation character set. So um, the custom format that it uses is super simple. It's just a type, length, value. So it's exactly what you would expect. So for a core foundation array, for example, has a D word, uh, hex 11, big endian, then the number of entries followed by serialized array entries. Core foundation string, type is seven, length is the length excluding the null terminator, and then the character data. Core foundation data, basically the same. Yeah, they're almost all like very, very simple and uninteresting. Apart from core foundation character set. So from the Apple document, uh, from the Apple uh, developer docs, you can find out that a uh, character set is just a set of Unicode compliant characters. Really, it's just a bitmap saying what characters are valid for my character set. It's just a big bitmap. Which you can index into to say, is this a valid um, character? So how do they actually implement their serialized core foundation character set? So again, it has a type for X1B, it has a compressed length. It then has this flag, which I've called fill with FF, and we'll see what that means. It then has an uncompressed length and some compressed data. So how do they compress it? So it's a sort of a bit like run length encoding, but you can only have repeated runs of either null bytes or FF bytes. And you have to decide at the beginning whether you want all the repeated uh, bytes to be, or all repeated bits to be zero or one. Then the format is just you have a raw data length and then some raw bytes. Uh, these are all, the lengths here are all uh, two bytes. So you have a two byte raw length, then that number of bytes of raw bytes. Then you have a repeated length. And you can say I want hex FF, FF, and it will, depending on the value of the fill with FF flag, either set those all to ones or to zeros. And it just keeps going on and going on and going on. So, yeah, what do you expect? There is absolutely no bounds checking on any of the decompression there. They do actually have some bounds checking, but they only bounds check that they don't read out of the, uh, they don't read off the end of the input. They never check that they don't write off of the end of the output. So they completely trust the uh, uncompressed length when they allocate the buffer. And so this is probably too small to see, but those of you who spend a lot of time in IDA, even just looking at this function, you can see there aren't enough branches to, to have that kind of memory copying loop, and they just can't bail out, and they don't. Uh, so 
those are the two, or uh, the handful of IPC mechanisms that I have looked at in detail for this talk. I mentioned there are a bunch more, and so what I'm gonna give you here is just like a little flavor of what the other IPC mechanisms are, and we'll pop a root shell just because that's what you gotta do. So, there's this thing called distributed objects. It's really, really old. Um, I haven't found anyone out there who actually knew really what it was. Um, it's from like next step, so it's really ancient. And it allows transparent RPC by exposing local objects into another process context. So you're supposed to be able to just take your existing Objective-C code base and suddenly make it RPC aware. Um, it doesn't really work, which is why no one uses it. But some OSX system services do still use it. Uh, so you can look at this code later. This is an example of how you vend an object using distributed objects. So basically, we define on the left-hand side um, the interface for the object which we want to vend. So just in the same way that you would um, define the interface and implementation of a regular Objective-C object, but we use this funny one-way keyword, which you probably haven't seen unless you've done distributed objects. And this is basically a hint to the distributed object's runtime that this thing doesn't return. Uh, it doesn't have a return value. So don't try and like, get a return value. Uh, so on the right, you can just see a little uh, main function. And I'm going to vend this toVend class. Or oh, sorry, vend me called toVend. Uh, and I'm going to use the service name, service name. Uh, and this actually goes ahead and just uses, uh, this is vended just by launch D. So anyone can go ahead and look up service underscore name, and they'll be able to invoke methods on the vend me object on the left-hand side. So, for example, this is how they would do it. They would create uh, NS connection root proxy for connecting the registered name, service name, and what that really does under the hood is talk to launch D using the bootstrap port, look up service name, and then talk when it invokes the foo method, passing one, two, three, it talks using whatever the distributed object serialization format is, and I don't actually know, over that mach port and calls this method on the remote object. So this might sound kind of terrifying. So you can have these things called distributed object protocols, which basically say, I have this big object, which has all of these crazy methods that I don't actually want you to call. All I want you to be able to do is call the foo method. So in my case, my, my interface only had one method, so it's not interesting. But in this case, you could define a protocol with just one method in it. Then when you declare the vend me interface, you can use this uh, uh, triangle bracket syntax to say, this is a vend me object, which like inherits from NS object, and it, I don't know what the correct word is, but implements uh, the my protocol protocol. And then when you want to use that, you can use this, set the protocol for proxy. In this case, when you're sending a message, this is only, a, this is only an optimization, but on the receiving end, it is actually going to try and enforce that only those messages are sent. So NS coding was very briefly mentioned um, in the previous talk. NS coding is also what is used uh, for serializing custom, so that is like a classes that distributed objects doesn't know about and it wants, and you want it to make a copy of it. So you define, I haven't got any uh, example code for this, but you define your own NS coding init with coder method and you can then go ahead and create an object from bytes. Uh, so let's see if this works. So this is an example of um, a logic bug somewhere on OSX. Uh, I think it's on every single OSX version ever, and it's a very silly bug. So keep an eye on our bug tracker for um, details. Anyway, uh, as you can see here, it's just a jailbreak exploit. These are all like not set UID root. And if I just call this like get shell, well, it doesn't look like I've got a shell. So about, that could be completely fake, so we can like, uh, well, it's very small, sorry. Let's go to uh, temp. 
and then in this thing, which is a root shell, trust me, you can just like echo hello to temperature break. And uh, lo and behold, yes, we have uh, this function called jailbreak, owned by root. Uh, we uh, have a look at it. Hello. So all of these crazy, obscure um, IPC mechanisms are used. And uh, yeah, this bug is very silly. Uh, so there are more. So there's this thing called NSXPC connection, which is a modern version, is it modern? modern version of distributed objects. Uh, and you saw in Patrick's talk that he showed a demo of root pipe. And so root pipe is a bug in a service exposed via an NS XPC connection. So this uh, gives you basically the same kind of things you get from distributed objects. The code to set up an NS XPC connection is a little convoluted. So I mean, uh, take this code, take a look at it, and then you can find all the services that vend these things later on. Uh, but basically, it's, you set it up in a similar way. So uh, in this case, we're connecting to a service. We create an NSXPC connection, talking to service name. We then have to define its protocol, which is exactly the same kind of thing we did for distributed objects. And then we resume it. And then in this case, we can call the foo method. Uh, so in the root pipe case, they were connecting to a, a real service, not service name. And they were just able to call a method, which basically, as you saw from Patrick's talk, just copied a file as root. But this was the IPC mechanism that was underlying it. Uh, and so on the server side, so if you want to actually vend, one, uh, vend an object using an NSXPC connection, you have this, like again, kind of uh, convoluted code. Take a look at it at home, where you have to uh, declare this thing called a delegate. And then in that delegates accept new connection, you have to accept a connection and then export an object. But eventually, what this really means is I can export the vend me object again. And then this code on the previous slide will be able to call the foo method. Um, and this is implemented in, uh, I think this is a core foundation. Uh, so the, I think the last type of IPC that I'm going to talk about are distributed notifications. So these are really interesting because they are actually used quite a lot. And there are some fundamental problems with them that maybe developers haven't thought about. So distributed notifications is fundamentally like a one-to-many or kind of many-to-many -many, uh, broadcast messaging system. There's a centralized daemon who you actually talk to. And that centralized daemon then knows everyone who is subscribed to a particular name, to a particular message name. And everyone who is subscribed to that message will be notified that it has been sent. What people might not realize is you can actually attach a core foundation dictionary to those broadcasted messages. And the most important thing, you don't have any idea, at least you shouldn't, depending on what API you use, you have no idea who actually posted that notification. So they could be pretending to be someone else. So if you're a daemon running as root, responding to distributed notifications that you think are being sent by someone because no other system service actually sends these, then you're doing it really wrong. Uh, and I say, it's pretty widely used. So there are a bunch of um, bugs that will be de-restricted soon, hopefully. Um, in distributed notifications. Uh, so here's just some example code showing you how you can uh, send a distributed notification. So again, you can take a look at this at home, but basically you can create a uh, core foundation dictionary. You can add whatever you want into that dictionary. So in this case, just a key and a value, but there might be cases where, for example, they decide to just send a raw data buffer containing whatever they want and go ahead and deserialize it into something much more complicated. So in this case, we're going to post the notification called my notification name, and we're going to attach that dictionary. And what that means is that in everyone who has subscribed to my notification name, they're all going to get a copy of this dictionary that we create here. And they're probably then going to go ahead and parse those keys and do something based on that. 
So again, on the receiving side, just so you can go ahead and find where all of this code is actually used. So we have uh, two steps to receive distributed notifications. We firstly register a callback function for a particular notification name. So in this case, I'm saying I want to subscribe to all notifications of my notification name. And whenever one of those is posted, call off of my run loop, call the my notification callback. And the fifth argument for uh, well, notification callback is an attacker controlled core foundation dictionary. And there are a bunch of services that do some pretty funky stuff with those core foundation dictionaries. So just briefly discuss a little bit about how to create stronger sandboxes on OS X and if it's possible. So one thing that came up in the last couple of weeks after we published a whole bunch of those font debugs and people went out and found more was the idea of a Mach message firewall. So you've seen in the Mach message structure that actually almost all of those IPC mechanisms do their message demuxing based on the ID field. So the idea is basically, can we create a firewall that only allows through certain Mach message IDs? And so Chromium, in Chromium, we have um, a prototype of this, which we had hoped to ship, but it was broken in Yosemite because they completely rewrote LaunchD and they removed the admittedly deprecated APIs that we were using to allow us to um, intercept um, all of the Mac messages and be able to take them or forward them on. They were using this thing called bootstrap namespaces and now this is completely gone. And everything is now based on XPC. So a few final notes if anyone from Apple out there is listening and they want some hardening tips. Uh, user space ASLR on 64-bit OS X is completely ineffective in many scenarios and it could be made much, much better. Um, you have a huge address space, so you don't need to limit yourself to using just two tiny bits at either end of it. Um, heap spraying, like the example I showed in the XPC exploit, just shouldn't work. It would be awesome if they had a system provided mechanism for more granular sandboxing of Mach services. So we saw, for example, that FontD, just one of those FontD services had 47 different API endpoints. Um, the current sandboxing model only allows you to say, you can talk to font D, but you can't talk to it at all. And if you can talk to it, you can talk to all of those methods when, in actual fact, you probably don't want to be calling the one that just takes a pointer to an object because you probably aren't actually using whatever that is. And the last little point, yeah, Ubuntu does run really nice on Apple hardware, so there you go. <laughs> um, check out the last link especially, which is a link to the uh, Google Project Zero issue tracker, and like all the exploits that I spoke about are posted up there uh, with a lot more information and a lot more detail. And yeah, these two books are really awesome and you should buy them. Thank you.